Um, my name is Theresa Kagalerche. I work for the Open Data Institute. We're based in London, and you'll see the number five up there because we're celebrating our fifth birthday this year. So we were founded um, in 2012 and have worked on open data since then, really. And uh, similar to what uh, Catherine suggested, initially the idea was a lot to focus on just getting data out there, but we evolved from that and kind of I want to share that thinking that we're doing at the ODI with you today. So a little bit of history. We were founded by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Nigel Shetbold, the inventor of the web and an AI expert in 2012. Our mission is to solve the current problems that the world is facing using the web of data, so using data to make something with it and to solve problems rather than being focused on data for the sake of being excited about numbers. And we are based, our headquarters are based in London, but we work internationally, so we have global projects all over. Um, and we have nodes that we operate through, and those nodes are located um, both in different cities in the UK and all over the world, and we have one in Sweden as well, in Gothenburg, and I think most of you would have met Karin yesterday, who was heading that node. So why are we so interested in data? Um, well, data is becoming increasingly valuable. I think generally um, the economy sees value in data because of uh, data analytics and the uh, amazing opportunities that it presents. And in fact, often data is compared to the oil. So often people say data is the new oil, which highlights how important it is as a resource. I find the analogy of data and oil a little bit tricky because once you use the oil, it's used up and it's no longer there. Whereas data, you can use and you can use again and use again. And in fact, it becomes even more valuable the more it is being used because of connections that can be made. So I much prefer the analogy of data, comparing data to roads. Um, and roads are pretty boring in themselves. I mean, that's a nice picture, but it's not nice because of the road, it's nice because of the pretty background. But we like them because they get us somewhere, they get us to a destination, and that's why we find them convenient. And that's how we like to think about data. We think data lets, uh, gets us to an informed decision, and that's why we find it interesting. Um, oftentimes, also, roads connect. So they connect businesses, they connect people together, and the same role we have uh, an understanding for data. But we also know that roads don't just appear out of nowhere and aren't just um, there to make our lives easier. We need to plan them, we need to make them, we need to maintain them, and we need to invest in them and decide which roads to make wider and which roads to make easier to travel on, and all of these decisions take money. And why don't we think about data that same way, where we need to actively build our data infrastructure in order for it to lead us to those decisions and for, in order for us to be efficient with it. So I want to present three possible scenarios for our data future, linking back again to analogy of roads. So there's one scenario in which we become very much concerned about personal data issues and any risks associated with that. Um, but because of that fear, there's a scenario where we just lock access to all data and no one has access to any of it, and we just build a fence around it, basically. Or we have a system where we're very much concerned about the commercial aspects of data. Well, if data is so valuable, I'm not going to give it away for free, I'm going to sell it. But then we get to a system which is paid for access to data, which means, much like a toll road, organizations and corporations who have money to pay for data have access to it and are able to make decisions for the rest of us? Or do we want a future that is open, where everyone has access to data and where people are supported to understand that data and to use that data and we design our future together? At the ODI, we believe in the third scenario. Um, but again, that takes investment and policy that supports that open future. We can't just expect it to happen on its own, and I want to take you a little bit through the steps that we think are important for the open data movement to get there. That doesn't mean that all data needs to be open. In fact, we understand data on a spectrum. You see on this side that there's some data that should be closed, 
Um, an example would be personal data, so my medical information. If I go to the doctor and I get a blood test done, I don't want that data to be openly available for anyone to see. In fact, I want it very much protected. Um, however, if I need to go and see another specialist, if, if they refer me somewhere else, I do want them to share that information and I want them to have systems that allow this sharing. And I'm even happy if some of that data is used for medical research to develop better treatment options and to advance science. So there's value in sharing some of that data, but under a certain um, regulation that protects that data. But then there is data that should be open, such as I want to go online and I want to find out where the closest doctor is to my house. Or I want to be able to find out how I can get there using public transport. And that data should really be open because there's no reason why it should be closed, basically, and it really helps people and makes the economy more efficient. What's important with open data is that it requires an open license that explicitly says that that data can be used for all kinds of purposes. Um, including commercial ones, because otherwise it limits the use and it's not really open. At the ODI, we advocate for openness along that spectrum. So even though we're called the Open Data Institute, we're really the Open Data Institute. We're advocating for openness across this spectrum. This means that I should be able to have access to my own medical information. I should know who is using that data, who has access to it, how it's stored and how it's being shared. Um, much like roads and other infrastructure, there is incredible economic potential in data and in open data especially. In the UK, it's estimated that 1.8 billion pounds are generated directly every year through open data and that's just businesses basically who work with open data directly. If we then look at the uh, productivity and spillover effects across the economy, we realize that this amount more than triples. So it's quite important it's happening, what do we do about it to get to that future and to realize that potential? From the five years of experience working with governments, businesses and individuals uh, and journalists, we have come to this sort of image of these are the things that need to be in place in order for an open data initiative to be successful. First of all, there needs to be a strategy in place. So you need to know what problems are you trying to solve with your data, how are you going to get there, and what is the data that is needed. Um, the second point refers to infrastructure, meaning that uh, the right policies and the right technology is in place in order for that data to become valuable. We talk very much about learning. Uh, that doesn't mean data science skills necessarily, but more of a general understanding in uh, society about what data is and how it can be used. And we need to actively support those who are innovating with data. And I'm looking forward to hearing from some of them later today. Generally, I think open data movement kind of started with, let's put all the data out there, let's train people to analyze it, and then innovation will happen. But we're now seeing this shift globally of moving on and saying, hold on, open data isn't the end goal. It's actually a tool to achieve a certain goal or to achieve a certain impact. So we're moving away from just opening it up and waiting for innovation to happen to being a little bit more strategic, starting with the problem you're trying to solve and then understanding how data can help that. That requires data literacy across society so that we don't leave uh, the analysis and the insights to experts and that we build in the impact we want to achieve beyond publishing the data. Um, I'm going to give a short example for each of these, how we would address them in practice. Uh, so Ukraine is a country that faces uh, a lot of problems with corruption. The government, however, is determined to fight against that and to promote transparency and accountability in the public sector. And they chose to use open data to promote that cause. So they started with a clear mission. In 2016, they joined the Open Data Charter and the uh, Open Data Initiative really took off massively. Just in one year, they jumped up 18 rankings in the Open Data Barometer, um, released lots of data and started building that ecosystem. But more interestingly, they actually, from that initiative, developed uh, an open procurement platform called Prozoro, which is one of the most transparent procurement platforms in the world and is now being rolled out to all the ministries in the government, meaning that Open data had a clear mission and they're working towards achieving that um, rather than 
releasing the data and hoping for things to happen. What we need as well is a broad data literacy across society. We heard a lot of talks yesterday and today about people making decisions, writing algorithms, influencing how data is being used. But if we as a society don't have an understanding of what data is and how data can be used and what impact data analysis has on our lives, then we leave all these decisions up to experts. So we think it's important to kind of build that as a core capacity of everyone in society. Sometimes we use unconventional ways to talk to people about data. Um, so this is a chips machine that is, uh, instead of putting in coins, actually is hooked up to a BBC News uh, RSS feed, and whenever the headline of recession pops up, a bag of chips is being dispensed. We have that in the ODI kitchen in London, and sometimes it's nice when you hear bad news on the on TV or read about bad news to get comforted with some nice food uh, for free. But on the other hand, you could also imagine a scenario where actual events happening in the world, environmental, political, actually affect your impact, uh, your, your access to food. So this is kind of a way of bringing data closer to actual impact um, it has on people. If we talk about supporting innovation more broadly, we need to, I think, actively support the people who are innovating with data because those are the people that we need to solve our problems. You can do that through innovation challenges, hackathons. We uh, like to run startup accelerator programs. These are a selection of our programs across the world. So some in the UK and Europe, Mexico and Southeast Asia. And we really try to help uh, startups and young businesses to develop their data strategy based on open data, so not just selling data and getting money from that, but seeing value in the analytics and in the insights that they get and releasing open data themselves. This is uh, an overview of the startups we have incubated so far. Um, what's interesting about it is that they cover all sorts of uh, industries, so we have agriculture, health, nutrition, um, transport, sports, so it's really wide-ranging, and there's a lot of data that they use, and all of them find value in data and releasing data openly as well, which I find quite impressive. Um, in the last few minutes, and I know I'm touching in on a lot of things, but I'm hoping that the other speakers will pick up on those things later on, I want to talk a little bit about current research we're conducting. So we're doing a lot of engagement work, uh, but we also like to keep up with things that are going on, so maybe some of these would be relevant for some of you as well. So we've recently received funding from the UK government to conduct a three-year research and development program, and we're starting the first year with these six topics. So we want to understand better how we can make it easier for people to publish data, and make it easier for them to develop their own standards because standards are so important to link up data sets and draw conclusions from them. We want to understand how open data affects service delivery in government and how it affects the economy, um, such as peer-to-peer -peer accommodation models. Um, we want to help businesses understand new emerging trends such as artificial intelligence and blockchain and how they in turn affect their data policy as a government, as an organization, and we're building connections between UK and French cities as kind of the, one of the leading uh, open data economies. I'm leading on the open data service delivery project, so I want to share our thinking a little bit around that, and we're still in the process of researching, so rather than presenting the final product, I wanted to just kind of share our thinking and hopefully get some feedback from you. So what do we think about when we think about open data enabling public services? Who in the room has used the application CityMapper before? Okay, so some of you, that's quite nice. In London, I think everyone would have raised their hand because that's basically how we get around because it's a disaster to try driving and it's just such a convenient um, application to help you get from one place to the next. So basically how it works is you enter where you want to go and it calculates the best way to get there. It's quite simple, it's very efficient, you receive live updates along the way in case there's a delay, it gives you an alternative route, you can choose ways where 
you don't get rained on or you don't like taking the bus so it chooses trains and so on. It's very convenient and it seems quite simple. So Transport for London, which is the London Public Transport Authority, released their life updates uh, data openly with an API and then this application was built drawing in that data and providing a service to the users. What's interesting about it is that there's a clear benefit to us because we're using public transport and it's more convenient, but also there's a clear benefit to Transport for London because they now, because people enjoy going on public transport more, they actually are more likely to go on public transport and spend money on public transport. So it's a great example where a government department releases open data and the benefit actually comes back to that government department. I think often the idea of economic benefit and transparency that open data generates is really well understood. But then if you're working in a department that has data, you might not necessarily benefit from overall economic growth. But so what we're trying to do with this project is to demonstrate these examples where actually the organization releasing the data benefits directly from that release. Uh, and we know that there are lots of them out there, so we want to showcase and highlight them a little bit. So we want to understand them, disseminate them, and experiment how you can make them better, basically. This is another example that we're looking at. Um, so Leeds is a city in the north of England, and they have different bins, so green, brown, and black, and they don't know when they're being, citizens don't know when their bins are being collected. And the city has a lot of costs of sending out notifications, writing letters every week to tell people when their bins are being collected. So ODI Leads, one of our nodes, developed this app where you just put in your address and then you get notifications, your bin will be collected tomorrow morning. Very easy, right? It's a simple solution, it's very easy to get there. Just release that data and you have an app. In reality, it's not so easy. And that's one of the things we're learning throughout this project. And this isn't a final product by all means, so please don't uh, um, take this as a final one. But we started kind of drawing out how these examples work in practice. And what we found out is that they're amazingly complex. Actually, we discussed this with the city council and became even more complex. And what I want to highlight, I guess, is that it's not that easy. You can't just put out open data and then wait for innovation to happen. It's a very um, complex process. It's possible and it's very important, but we need to understand these links that are involved and the different actors that are involved and find out how we can best support them to make innovation happen. So just coming back to the three points I made at the, uh, earlier in the presentation, encouraging us to move away from open data as a goal in itself and look at open data as a tool to achieve uh, the impact that we want to achieve. What we need for that is to be strategic about and clear about what we want to achieve. We need data literacy across the population so that we can contribute to innovation and that we can challenge innovation that comes up. Um, and we need to design our impact into our open data program, so not um, going beyond uh, releasing the data and actually looking at how we can support the wider ecosystem. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Therese. I think perhaps what you said here at the, at the end that we should, we should just really stop looking at open data as a goal in itself pretty much sums up the kind of program we have today because perhaps that is really the reason why we're seeing so many different topics that we need to speak about today, that people are slowly starting to realize what you're talking about. It's not just about making data available or it's not just about asking to have data because you want to create something. You need to think about it as a, as a bigger thing and most of all probably you need to think about the problems you want to solve. I was wondering, does any of you have any, any questions for Therese now that you have her? You have uh, a very s special chance to, to ask her any questions? We have a question here in the front. Hello, Christina Knarving, Gothenburg University. So do you have any, ex any examples of good data literacy uh, programs in school? I mean, for younger students. Uh, cities or countries that have managed to implement some kind of data literacy teaching? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. We started thinking about that more recently because 
it's so important to start early to understand these things because they're such a big part of modern life. Um, we don't currently run any school education programs. We focus much more on adults. We have free e-learning, lunchtime seminars, and so on. But I know that Ukraine, I think, is experimenting with that, engaging with students and trying to get them to understand the basics of data. So it's definitely something that's coming up. Um, yeah, but we're not currently involved in that directly. All right, anybody else? Two other questions. Hi, I'm Josephine from the University of Lulio. Um, uh, I was thinking, how, how is the general awareness about open data today in Britain? The general awareness of open data? Yeah, sort of among the citizens. Um, that's an interesting question because I think it's easy for us because we're working and thinking about open data so much. And a lot of government departments understand it. We have a lot of private sector um, corporations that work with us, so it's definitely growing. But I also have friends at home who still don't know what I'm doing for work every day and who don't really know open data. I think one way to improve that is to just think about practical examples of where open data has been used and problems that have been solved, rather than trying to understand it on kind of an abstract level. Hey, uh, my name is Pierre. I'm a Frenchman lost in this cold country. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this UK-France task force you mentioned. And I mean, concretely, what actions are you doing? between? Sure. Um, so I'm not personally working on that project, but I can give a brief overview. That it's basically pairing up cities in France and in the UK to work together on their open data mission and to work together to solve challenges. Um, but that's all I know about it, but I'm happy to connect you with my colleagues who are working on it, so you can take that further. Thanks. Right, so I think um, I'll say thank you very much to you, uh, Therese, and please be back for our panel debate uh, at the end of this session.